Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by Carbonite. Sign up for Carbonite and use the promo code TWIST to receive your special offer. And by MailChimp. Manage lists with up to 2,000 subscribers and send up to 12,000 emails per month for free with MailChimp. Today on This Week in Startups, it's our news roundtable. Mixergy founder Andrew Warner is with us. I don't know where he's living now, but boy, do I miss that guy not being in L.A., all Things D writer Liz Gaines is with us. Lon Harris is going to read the news. Tyler Crowley is going to give us some insights. All that and more on a very, very big news week on This Week in Startups. Let's do it. It's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't going to live like me. Until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Ah, uh, hey everybody, hey everybody, welcome to this week in startups. It's Friday. We've got an amazing show for you. Liz Gaines is here from All Things D. She's brilliant and a great writer. Andrew Warner from Mixer G. He's the guy who does those awesome interviews. Um, and of course, Tyler Crowley is here in studio. How are you doing, Tyler? I'm good, thanks. Uh, Lon Harris made it across town from Ranker.com to read the news, and we're going to have an awesome yeah. episode. I mean, in the the highlights are amazing. I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot to talk about. What the hell happens? What? It's like one story in particular. I know you did not comment on this week. I thought I, really. I, I was expecting to hear uh, your perspective. You know, I have a lot to say about that story, but it's like when you see. Let's say somebody you wanted to see die. <laughs> is Just hypothetically. Hypothetically. Right. Somebody you wanted to see die in a fiery death. Right. Was in a car crash, and the car was like flipping, and everything's exploding on the 405. I don't right. need to go in and say, like, I don't like that person. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, they're going to be, they're just getting destroyed. Right. And it's just like a they're massive already car exploding. I don't. I don't wish anybody death. I would like to see people's careers burn up in a fiery <laughs> disaster, yes, but not All death. Right. Okay, fair hey, enough. Let me tell you about a great product that I use every week. And I use today to send out my email newsletter. You may have read I wrote an email newsletter today. Could Jobs, you, do we you, even deserve them? Could you not come up with a segue between those two? I had no. There was no. <laughs> speak of something that's on fire. Yeah. <laughs> MailChimp, perfect. Go. Nice. Perfect. Nice. I feel like you're craving today. I don't know. I had like a lot of espresso, and I feel like I should stand. I should. <sighs> Bye. <laughs> you know, I just love watching his show. Yeah, he's just such it's a maniac. Even if you don't, even if you're not at put, all concerned with what he's talking about. I just put the sound about. off, and I put on like some um, Three Stooges. Right. And I just let it go. The Benny Hill theme song. <laughs> yeah. Or do, 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 do. Hey, Mailchimp, Mailchimp. E -e 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 -e. I sent out to 25,000 people today, and I got all these CEOs writing me back. Oh, brilliant editorial, whatever. If I had put that on the web, none of them would even know it existed. Everybody's too busy. Nobody's reading these websites and tech meme and everything like that. It's so much noise. You get a thousand people commenting on every silly news story, mm -hmm. like we'll do on today's program. Sure. But if you want to <laughs> rise above the noise, use email. E -e 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 Mailchimp. That's it. That's the advertisement. We're done. Okay, 12,000 free emails per month, 2,000 subscribers. You know all the deal. Um, it's just a great company, and the free plan is always free. Go ahead and start it. And I believe, and Andrew Warner is going to back me up on this in a minute, social media is your resume, and building an email list is one of the best things that individual can do to build a constant relationship with people. We should ask people. Andrew, because we tend to do this with MailChimp. Yeah. We always ask guests, do you, are, do yeah, you use Andrew. MailChimp? Yeah, I bet you Andrew. Andrew, are you there? I, I, Hold Can't on. hear Andrew. Hold on a second. Andrew's got the beautiful right. eight thousand dollar microphone. We can't He's talking right yes. now about how much he loves Mailchimp. Exactly. So just can't hear. <laughs> can we hear Andrew? Oh, Warner? you guys can't hear me. How's this? Okay. No. Liz, can we hear you? Oh no way. Liz, uh, can you I hear me? I, I can wait. hear you fine. Oh, okay. Hey, we hear everybody. Hey, Liz. hey, Liz. How are you doing? Good. Hey, Andrew. How are you doing? Good. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. We hear you perfectly. Yes, yes. So where are oh, you? Great. Where, hey. where, where are you, Andrew, right Jason, now? Jason, I'm in D.C. Let me say something about email because now you're talking about something that I'm really passionate about. If yeah. you go to Mixergy.com now, the first thing you're going to see is a request for an email address. And yeah. the reason for that is I'm discovering that email is so much more powerful than even blogging. When you go to a blog, you hit it, and maybe you return. When you sign up to an email list, you stick with it, and you get to build that relationship okay. with the site. 
I, I think we're underestimating, most of us in the new world of tech are underestimating the old technology of email. It's so powerful. If you go to whitehouse.gov right now, you'll see the first thing they do is they ask you for an email address because they want to connect with you. And Obama is- I think what you're saying is about a, a, like six months too old though. Like yesterday I got a, a really interesting tip in my inbox about Groupon and it had Groupon in the subject line, so I didn't open it. I get so many of those, right? <laughs> I mean, <'cause> I'm <laughs> Groupon, speaking of Groupon, what a disaster this is turning out to be. Wow. We, what's the, let's make that the first story. All right, well, there's, there's two Groupon stories. One is breaking, so we should talk about it because it's happening right now. Hundreds of Groupon sales department employees have filed a class action lawsuit against the company, charging that it has failed to pay them overtime. This is not really news that we've been paying attention. Is his Cox not a sponsor this week? <laughs> exactly. Right. Uh, this is a, not a lot of news if you've been paying attention to Groupon. They were sort of notorious uh, for sort of being slave drivers and driving their employees really hard. Uh, Renita Daly, a former salesperson at Groupon, is lead plaintiff in the suit. It was filed last month in Illinois. The suit demands back wages for the past three years, plus punitive damages for non-payment of overtime. Uh, and it's not the first time Groupon has faced such a suit in March 2010. Another class action lawsuit was filed alleging that the company violated gift certificate laws. What a disaster. Uh, Liz, have you followed this story yet? It's just breaking now. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I just saw it today. I mean, sounds like, uh, you know, something that Silicon Valley people might, wouldn't complain about is overworking, but salespeople in Chicago, maybe, maybe so. Yeah, it's a little bit bizarre, I'll tell you. When people who work at a startup company who have massive amounts of um, stock options then sue their own employee, it's sort of unprecedented. It means it's like they don't believe in the company because if you sue your boss, your, your boss is going to be like, I don't want to work with you. When you get a group of people who sue a boss, like if that happened to me and I'm Andrew Mason, you know, I'd be like, you know what, I haven't done my job hiring the right people. I quit, mm. I'm out, I'm gonna start a new company. Like you're suing me, your boss, and we all own stock options and overtime in a startup company? I mean, what are we talking about here? I mean, there's- Well, a, that's part of it, right? It's like these are Chicago and they're sales folks. It's not like Silicon Valley <laughs> engineers who, who have decades of sort of a background yeah, context but, for but this how- This to me means a total lack of loyalty. And this is what happens when you build a business quickly is, and I've had this happen to me. Right. I, you know, when you don't know the last 20 people in the door and you didn't interview them, you didn't get to f not hire people who you know could be trouble down the road. Like I ask people, how would you feel if I asked you to come into work or the systems were down and we had to work and some people are like, do I get paid overtime? And I'm like, yeah, that's a good question. And then that's the end of the interview. <laughs> and then other people are like, <laughs> other people are like, oh, well, whatever it takes to keep the thing going. You know, yeah. I worked at a magazine, and if we had to stay all weekend to publish, we publish. That's just how it is. It's like that at Rank or two. I mean, if we bring in people and they're not hungry and they really want to work on this and they're willing to go the extra mile, we don't bring them in. But at the same time, that's a clo uh, Ranker and, and Mahalo and This Weekend. Tight companies. I mean, not huge, maybe a hundred employees You can't grow 1,000, 2,000 employees when you and get not get complainers and whiners. Andrew, yeah. what are your thoughts on Groupon? Mm -hmm. And this in specific. I think one of the problems is, do you remember when they got hit with a class action lawsuit in the past and Andrew Mason went right to his blog and he yeah. said, oh, class action lawsuits are the way to make money? I'm gonna class action lawsuit Groupon also. Groupon class action lawsuits itself. He is so good at answering back critics and he's so good at being witty and getting people's attention, but this IPO process has, has just muzzled him and it's taken away one of his strongest powers and one of his company's strongest powers and it's painful to watch. I can imagine them on the inside saying they could defend themselves against so much of what's going on, yeah. but they're not allowed to. This and, is a and tough process. And why couldn't they, why, I mean, if they have all this money in the bank, why couldn't they just pay off all the employees and just say, okay, listen, you guys are reasonable, we'll give everybody a little extra stock options, but and everybody's gonna get $1,000. That's probably also they were, part of the problem is some people at the company are just rolling in it, and the people in this class action yeah, lawsuit are not. that's an issue too, is they all cashed out at the top, and so. But it's also because the, the, be IP, the IPO was pending, and then is, it, is, it, is there any connection that well, two, two days ago is now announced like it might get derailed? This is a typical S-bag lawyer move when you're hurting to pile on to try to put pressure mm. on you. Ha, my, my question is this, had that uh, had the IPO gone through and it looked like it was still gonna happen, this, would not, gonna, no, this, this would not have happened. No, 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 because nobody, right. nobody would want to risk the IPO not happening. This right. is, people think Groupon's weak, the employees might actually think Groupon's gonna go out of business or go down in flames, they're not gonna get anything out of it, they might as well get something now. Yeah, that's, what it's, that's what it smells like to me. 
Yeah, it's also just it's not it's not a close knit environment. They don't feel like they're they're going after their former colleagues. They feel like oh, this scumbag company that took advantage of me for three yeah. years and now it's tanking. I want to get what I can. All out right, segue into the next story. Uh, so the next Groupon story, uh, we've we've sort of hit upon it already. They were expected to make their stock market debut with a valuation around twenty billion. They've now canceled their investor roadshow and are said to be completely reevaluating plans for an IPO. Their stated reason was stock market volatility. Uh, it had been thought the company might price its shares as early as, as mid September, so right now. Uh, this, of course, been a troubled road to the IPO all along. Uh, criticisms of their accounting practices, allegations that they violated SEC rules by leaking a memo. Um, so now it looks like Zing yeah, is going well, to get first. Truth so is, though, the, 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 the employees got they got half off on the attorney. It was, really, it, was a, it, was, it was a good deal. Fifty-five percent yeah. off. Hey, Liz, yeah. uh, I think Kara uh, Swisher actually released the memo from Andrew Mason. What are you guys hearing on All Things D with regard to the IPO? Was it because of the leaked memo? You're asking me who Kara's sources are? No, I mean, I know Andrew sent her the email. They're very friendly. Uh, as we saw at the D conference when he gave Andrew Mason oh my God, the, that the was death awesome. stare. That was pretty that awesome. That was one of the be- People got to watch that. Yeah, that's a pretty good That's one. one of the best. Yeah. No, seriously, uh, not who did you hear it from, but uh, what, what's the, I mean, you guys are obviously talking about this a lot. All Things D might be the reason this IPO um, gets got pulled. I mean, that's just the bottom line. Well, so what I, are think you guys that, talking I think about that we're too? talking about it a little bit more firmly than I understand how it's happening. I don't think it, the IPO is definitely off. The roadshow is definitely off. But uh-huh. obviously, there's a lot of internal conflict. And, you know, like Tyler was saying, it's hard because we can't talk about it. Right. Well, or, oh, I'm sorry, Andrew's Andrew, saying yeah. Andrew can't. You guys can talk about it all day long. Uh, do you think that they're going to get out or not? What's your intuition tell you? I think they grew so fast that, uh, and they were trying to like, you know, zoom all the way to the top, but they got cut off right before. Yeah. It's fascinating. I think it's a great company actually. And this just might be a case of when you put so much fuel into the rocket and you have so much thrust that just being off like 1% in a rocket, if you're going mock whatever, right. you can get pretty far off course, and that's what's happened to Groupon. It's a great company, I think, at its core. I think it's a trend that will be here 10 years from now. I just think when you start putting a $20 billion valuation on things, taking money out, mm. and growing this fast, all those things at the same time, and the really, I think the one thing that sent the rocket off course was that stupid accounting thing. We're, we're so innovative. Costs, yeah. I mean, it's a coupon company. Right? They could have just been humble and said, hey, we're a coupon company. And that's it. Instead, they go, oh, we're just a game changer, so we're going to have to come up with our own accounting practice. Whenever anybody says we have a new accounting practice, it basically means to, I don't know, investors, to Wall Street, to a lot of people, fraud. Yeah, well, we're pushing this off the books so that it doesn't, you know, it's more favorable. Mm -hmm. But what about, I mean, None of this really touches on what I feel like is the biggest liability of Groupon, which is all of these complaints that you constantly hear from small business owners who tried it and feel like they got burned or they I think didn't that's get the money out. I think that's overblown. Because you got to remember, they're operating in like a hundred and some odd cities. Right. It's a every bound to be day. Some, so if you do ten thousand of these please. Groupons a month, one percent of people are upset. That's a hundred. You know, yeah. so maybe one percent don't like it, but the other ones are lined up, and they got a six-month queue of companies. I mean, it's people true, yeah. consu- There's a certain amount of consumers that love it, and there's a certain amount of businesses that are demanding it, and they're sold I out. I bought one so, just the other day. Amoeba. Really? Amoeba Records. You see that? It's like no. half half off. It's like you pay you pay fifteen bucks, and you get thirty bucks worth of stuff in Amoeba. Wonder, anyway, what a, what a deal. Hey, you guys have anything else on Groupon, or we just move on to the next story? Move on. I think uh, email email's boring. Yeah, email's <laughs> email. boring. It's incredibly boring. <laughs> Not into it. Uh, well, well, we'll talk about probably the biggest uh, single tech news story of the week. Carol Bartz let go as CEO of Yahoo on Tuesday. Uh, Kara Swisher broke the news on All Things D. Uh, and, Bart had, and then Bart sent out a email to Yahoo employees confirming the news. In full, this is what it said to all. I'm very sad to tell you I've just been fired over the phone by Yahoo's chairman of the board. It's been my pleasure to work with all of you and wish you only the best going forward. Carol. CFO Tim Morse uh, was named interim CEO while the board searches for a replacement. Uh, Bart's then uh, published an interview with Fortune's Dan Premack following her termination. Uh, she referred to her fellow board members as doofuses and complained that they <laughs> effed her over. She didn't say F, uh, but I don't want to put... It was, uh, it was with Patty Sellers. Oh, sorry. 
Yeah. Uh, right. So Dan's uh, the one. Dan's the tech crunch. Uh, all the re- reporting about Arrington. Not yeah. Carol. All oh, right. I got my I got my uh, wires crossed here. <laughs> uh, since we reported that Bart may sign a non-disparagement clause in her employment contract, uh, which is still good for about ten million. Yeah, so but she may Doofus have is not that in technically no, 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 Doofus disparaging. No, no, no. Doofus is totally fine. <laughs> Doofus, <laughs> Doofus is totally not totally disparaging. Do they yeah. do they actually list out in a non-disparagement clause what the words you can call your boss are? No, but it's very vague, and okay. I think calling your fellow board members Doofuses, they have a case to not pay her her money. Uh, what do you think, Liz? Another great story broken by All Things D. You're having a good week. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think that they want anything to do with her anymore. They, you know, they severed that tie. It seems weird that they didn't have, it doesn't seem like they had much of a contingency plan, though. Um, but I guess they were worried that things were just going downhill fast, and if anything got out that, about them trying to fire her, that it would all be over. So. I think yeah. some someone said their stated reason was that they wanted to have the broadest search possible, but um, I don't know if you know firing the CEO and being in the state of disarray is a great way to go find a new CEO. Yeah, yeah. it seems weird that she didn't even necessarily feel it coming to a certain extent. Yeah. like it's obvious like they haven't had like a no big no she felt the heat for a long right. time. I so, mean she felt the heat since she took the job. What this is, sure. is so it, this is the confirmation that the worst thing you can do is put a non-product person in charge of a technology company. The technology companies that win have some combination of either founders or product-driven CEOs. And the ones that meander or go down or go sideways are ones with non-product-driven people. Tim Armstrong, um, Carol Bartz, Steve Ballmer, none of those are product people. They're sales people or operations people. And then on the other side, you've got Larry Page, Sergey, Steve Jobs, Zuckerberg. These are product-driven people. And I guess the question is Twitter, too. I mean, Twitter now is run by... Uh, I wonder, is Dick Costello a business guy, sales guy, or is he a product guy? I think he's more of a business sales guy. Anyway, this is what happens when you put somebody who's not a product person in charge of a company. They, putting Katarina Fakey in charge of Yahoo would have been a better result for the last year and a half, in my mind. Andrew, your thoughts? You know, you know I wanted to be prepared because I knew you were going to talk about this. And so I went back to articles from 2010, and I saw Business Insider, for example, blame Terry Semmel. And lots of people did. They said, he's finally out of here. He took half a billion dollars in salary and didn't do much. He took the company to enterprise, e-commerce, social media, et cetera. He wasn't focused. And then I went back about 10 years ago, and I saw articles blaming uh, <coughs> Tim Kugel. You know, that he was the problem because he was too much of an engineer. He didn't understand uh, media and they were uh, they were too invested in advertising. And I'm wondering if the problem with Yahoo is a little bit deeper than any one person that they just don't know what they're about. I mean, when you want to refer people to Yahoo, what do you why do you send them to Yahoo? Is it because they have search? No. Is it because they have the best email system or is it because they stand for something? I don't know what they stand for, and I think that that is the problem. And as it, much clearly. as individuals within the company may not be the right people to lead, I think the problem is that they just don't know what it's about. We don't know what it's about, and they don't either. So what would we do with Yahoo? I mean, if, if each of us was put in charge, what is the direction we put it in? Liz, what, what, what's your first, first day on the job as CEO? You tell the troops, we are a blank company. You know, I, this is kind of mean, but the only reason I go to Yahoo is when I go to a cafe and, you know, you have to trigger the, like, log into this internet connection screen. Yeah. yeah. So I type in Y and it goes to, and then it, like, loads in the Starbucks screen and then I click through. So you basically like, say I don't we're actually the shortest... want to go to Yahoo.com. Right. What's so you're, that? You're basically saying it's the shortest URL you could type in. That is what the value of Yahoo is. Well, it's five letters. I guess it's not exactly the shortest. But, yeah. but you type in the Y. Actually, they're trying to get Y.com. They, they filed a trademark yeah. because they're going to supposedly, Internet's going to sell the rest of the one-letter domains. There's only like three that have ever been given mm-hmm. before they stopped giving them. And one of them is X.com, which is owned by PayPal. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Actually, that was Elon little, Musk's first story. A little, little trivia. A little trivia there. Um, Tyler, what would you do? Your first day, you're in charge. <sighs> Yahoo is a blind company. Do, I, I do, would go, do, why not go ruthless? Do. Just start, you know... I think they need to bring a lot of craziness to that party. Yeah. Um, get some of the really smart people feeling like they want to work there. Right. I'd start throwing some crazy exclusive parties. So Yahoo is a party company. Right? Yahoo's a party company. <laughs> okay, very good. That's like, I mean, like some crazy <laughs> cool perks. Like an event planner? Yeah. No, I mean, like have <laughs> Kanye come and sing and like. Yeah, that'll solve the problem. It's great. It's <laughs> Yahoo will be the new Diddy. Yahoo <laughs> is the blind company. You know, uh, there are individual Yahoo products that I think totally still defensible. Uh, finance, sports. 
I, I would probably ditch a lot of the other stuff and just figure out where people were still engaged with Yahoo and expand those. So Yahoo is a blank company. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, you don't have, know either. I, don't know yeah, I mean, the games they lost games. That was the last thing I used to go to Yahoo for. Was they had yeah, casual games, but now you know, Google <laughs> sexy. Plus and Yahoo's a sexy company. Yahoo is the sexy company. They need to have a party at the Playboy Mansion and start doing crazy stuff. That gets people's that attention. That really worked well for MySpace, didn't it? No. Yeah, exactly. Oh, Tons yeah. of secret well, shows. Well played, Liz, actually. <laughs> the well played. Fighter secret show to yeah. save MySpace. Well, they only had about a week, a week of uh, trying the, that. The majority of their traffic is coming from people who want email still. A lot of people still use that Yahoo Mail. And a lot of it's the news. Finance product, sports product, yeah. just general news. Um, they missed out on buying Huffington Post. Uh, if I was running the company, I would say it is the, it's a content company. I will go full bore into video content uh, and text. And if you, the only thing I use it for now, really, is to go to um, Yahoo Finance and look at the disaster that is my portfolio now <laughs> over the last three months, see how much money I've lost. And then yeah. I watch Henry Blodgett explain to me how much more money I'm going to lose on the ticker <laughs> show, which is awesome. Yes, they do an original, Yahoo they do an original yeah. finance show that is awesome. And like it, people go watch it. Mm -hmm. And their video, it's so interesting. Carol Bartz came in. Shut down all the video assets, all the video assets. Remember they had the, they had a UStream like yeah. Yahoo Live or something, and they they had all this great product in video, and they shut everything down. Now everybody's sold out on video, and everybody's fighting over Hulu. Duh. Yeah, there's there's a few I have cases to say, like they got, that. I, I, the team at launch is making a list of all the things Carol Bart, Bart's launched. It is a complete disaster. It's like Yahoo launches, you know, unlimited. You know, storage for Yahoo Mail, or you right. know, faster searching on Yahoo Mail, or they launch um, instant search. They are just—they can't even play catch up. I mean, at the very least, you should be able to steal products as fast as Mark Zuckerberg does. <laughs> if well, Yahoo just got somebody in there who could steal as efficiently as Zuckerberg stole Foursquare, you know, MySpace innovations, uh, Quora innovations. Instagram innovations. All the, he just basically knocks everything off within three months, six months, just like the Germans and the Chinese do for the internet market. Why not just do that? Put somebody in charge of system knockoff orders. Actually, why don't they just get, they should gift Yahoo to Zuckerberg. This is true. For 20% of <laughs> Facebook and they just be like his news product. Face, Facebook news? Then yeah. the new, that's the news. All right, let's move on to the next story. Yeah, I mean, I, the content, I think, is, is what makes sense. Uh, Google has acquired Zagat, which will become the cornerstone of its local... Zagat. Zagat. Like me. Cat in the Hat. Okay, good to know. <laughs> I'm making tons of mistakes today. I don't know. It's okay. Nobody, you know, everybody pronounces it wrong. I just happen to know it to me. Zagat? Yeah. Zagat. Zagat. Like oh, Cat okay. in the Hat. Fair enough. Google that's how Tina told me to remember. Zagat, which will become the cornerstone of its local strategy by offering reviews, ratings, and insights for services and restaurants worldwide. Sale amount was undisclosed, but according to uh, TechCrunch, hmm. or the blog formerly known as TechCrunch, uh, it didn't trigger an FTC antitrust review, indicating it must have been less than $66 million. Uh, the company was founded by Tim and Nina Zagat hmm. more than 32 years ago, operating in 13 categories, more than 100 <coughs> cities. Tim and Nina are expected to stay on as co-chairs, and the company will apparently continue to produce the physical guides uh, that they've already become sort of known for. Uh, so how do you see Google integrating their content into its their current location and local offerings? And is this a case of wanting the brand name or is there something else that they wanted out of this deal? Liz, why did Google buy it? Hey, one thing is um, the Wall Street Journal just reported that it was actually $125 million purchase. Wow. So not a little more, which I guess was the same as they were valued at recently. So not as much of a markdown. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Google's really excited about figuring out local, and I think actually, like, if you go to these, I, I had a bad experience with Google Local last weekend. I tried to take some out-of-town folks to a restaurant, gave them the name of it. They looked it up, and it had like a bad address, you know, an address way across town. Um, that content is pretty hard. It's hard to figure out what what an address is, aggregate all the reviews around it, and so to have something like a quality anchor, I think, will help them a lot. Yeah, I, I think this is a great buy because. I was, when I was in Europe uh, recently, uh, I pulled out the Zagat on my iPad and I pulled out Yelp. And Yelp, it's all, uh, there's so many people on Yelp now and it's so egalitarian that reviews are typically by people who have either no taste, which is the majority of people, no knowledge, the majority of people. It's exactly the people you don't want commenting, right? 
Whereas Zagat, they give out the, the ability to give reviews. The way they started, it was the ultimate user-generated content. They handed, Tim and Nina would go to five or six restaurants in a night. I did it with them one night, went to a bunch of restaurants. They would hand people the physical surveys, and they'd say, oh, you're a foodie, you come here often. They would hand it to them. Or they would give the owner of the restaurant five review cards to give out. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of like friend of a friend, close-knit foodies. Right. And then they would take all the reviews, and it was not, it was done in a, very cloak and dagger or like non-transparent, opaque way, they would write these little summaries. Right. But they knew if a, if a place was on the upswing or downswing and it was all foodies writing them. Now Google's a content company. I mean, I know it's just a paragraph, but literally they're going to be employing writers who are then putting all this content together. So it's another one of those sort of check boxes like, hey, Google is kind of becoming a content company. Well, that, that was another thing that's interesting to me. The format of these reviews in these yeah. guides is nothing like what you expect out of crowdsourced internet content no. where here's my review and my name and you can go no. see my other reviews. This is like taking everybody's thoughts Quotes. and putting them editorially together. Yeah. Pure curation. Right. Are, are people are people going to be into that? Is that coming? Absolutely. When you look at the noise and the gaming that occurs in Yelp reviews, like, I, I'm, I'm in, I was in Lake Arrowhead mm -hmm. uh, over the holiday last week, and I, there's, a, there's a place that makes waffles. And the reviews on um, Yelp, Yelp you, you, it was so ridiculous. There was a line, this place is terrible. Yeah, you always get the And it was the like, well, wait a second. Right. Oh, I, my check, uh, we asked three times for maple syrup, and the woman didn't come. One star. One star. Yeah. And it's like, well, that's not a reason to give it one star. I mean, I understand the service was bad, but that's what, that's what they do very well. Service, decor, food. Right. And they blend it across all these reviews. I mean, at Yelp, the most terrible place has the same exact feel when you look at that page as the best place. Right. And you really have to learn how to read it and go like, okay, I know that half the people or two-thirds of people writing Yelp reviews are idiots. So I look, who's a, who's a Yelp elite? And who has a total number of friends? And so you do have some signals of quality there, but um, this is an you awesome know. purchase for them. And it's a big F you to Yelp after turning down the, the big you know, yeah. offer I, to I, buy them. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I feel like... Yelp works pretty well. There's definitely some of the issues that you, that you work with. Like, they're going to have to really step it up and have some great, crazy feature that I can't get on Yelp that makes me switch. Well, now, I mean, in a oh, way, Google is now human powered. Yeah, that well. Human, and I mean, has been for a little while now. <laughs> food ratings by humans, <laughs> sure. and that's going to be the sort order. Andrew, what do you say? It is such good quality over at Zagat. I think most of us don't recognize it because Zagat is a paid site. It doesn't show up in search yep. results when you're on yep. Google because it's a paid site. You don't get to experience it for a month or two before you actually fall in love with it the way you do with, with Yelp. I think this is an inspired acquisition. I think when people really start to experience free Zagat, and I have no doubt that it's going to go free because that's what Google does with their, with, uh, their acquisitions. Yep. And once they discover it, they're never going to go back to Yelp. Yelp is just, it's too much work. Even if all the even if all the reviews were quality, I have to sit and read five to get a really good overview of what's going on with a single restaurant. I'm not willing to do that. I just want to know, is this restaurant a romantic restaurant or not? Does it have vegetarian food or not? It's so, it's, it's, wow. it's, uh, it's going to be worth many I'm gonna times agree with more than I don't, I don't usually disagree with other people's takes on a product, but I, Yelp works amazingly for me. I rely on it a lot to like find good places, especially when I'm in neighborhoods I don't know. But at, at, when you look at those reviews and you see 300 reviews and you see the star rating and the star yeah. rating is always three and a half, it's like everything is three and a half in Yelp. How do you There's know if it's good or not? No, you do. He, Andrew's right. You you have to read the first few, and then you have to feel out these people. Like I, you know, I'm I'm in downtown now. So how now, much work does it and take? And a lot of the reviews will be like, "This place was scary," and it's just because people aren't used to being in downtown LA, and right. it really has nothing to do with the restaurant. So you do have to like develop right. that. So skill. how much work does it take for you to I, find a place? I, how I many still, minutes? Don't in you also have three to, get to five minutes. The, I can. I can right. Zero so it takes you five, five minutes to, to find a place you want to go. Which the gap, if it's a 26 or 27, it's good. That's it. You're done. It takes you three seconds. What do you say, Andrew? Uh, sorry, I, you also have to get past, uh, Yelp drives me nuts. You have to get past who's the duke of the place. I don't care who the duke is, who the first reviewer is. Congratulations to the first reviewer, but yeah, you're who getting cares? in my way. I don't I need agree. all that. Andrew's right, you're absolutely wrong. I don't know, I have, to, I have to say that I think that there are, th this topic seems to be really provocative for startups right now. A lot of really smart people are trying to do better versions of Yelp. So it does strike me as a little bit weird that Google goes to this really um, kind of old school business yeah. uh, rather than, I mean, it's kind of bizarre, but like every week I get pitched by another app that's using like data mining and collaborative filtering like Ness and Nosh and Alfred. Like these are all apps that have launched this summer. 
right. uh, to help you Everybody find thinks. a really great restaurant where you are. Which is I, why so many people are inspired by this idea, I don't know. I, I think Yelp is pretty good too. And a lot of these location-based services are also pitching themselves that way. Like, we're helping you find the best yeah. places that your friends I, like. I think absolutely with Zagat, this makes Google number one for restaurants. I believe that's what's going to happen a year from now. I mean, they will be where people look. People will look to Google slash Zagat for their restaurant reviews because the Zagat system is better than Yelp. I'm not saying Yelp is bad. I'm addicted to Yelp. I love Yelp. Yeah. I write Yelp reviews. There's Together, key, the two services. There's a very key difference from the restaurant owner's perspective as well, yeah. which is they have a, for the most part, very... They want to be in the Zagat rating system. Right, and they true. trust... Zagat's not comprehensive. Not everybody can be in Zagat. Right. And, and they, they trust there. Zagat reviewers are of a level where they're not going to get discounted right. for stupid things yeah, or Yeah, somebody silly spilled things, a, bot right. a glass of red wine one star. Right, no, that But totally restaurant true. owners go to great pains to try and get in it. Right, right. Where in the Yelp system, they the most of the emotions are quite negative. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to post... if you the, It's a really astute point, Tyler, because if you post to Yelp, it's because you're pissed off. And if you post to Zagat it's because you're enthralled with the restaurant and you love it. And Google wants to be associated with that love Positivity as with opposed those to negativity. owners. Because Google really wants to get into owning that review space of classifying, quantifying all of the local merchants and retailers of all kinds. So they, right. that's the long term play it, going on I mean, there. Does that mean they're going to start giving people tens in food and they're going to start... Well, now here's like the other, Zagat, no, which no, no, not include out. you. So here's the whole other different thing, which is Zagat's content wasn't part of Google's aggregate review system, mm -hmm. which is based on the five-star default ranking. Right. And they would aggregate in people who didn't even necessarily want to be in it, like Yelp, who's permanently on the fence of, do we want Google indexing our right. reviews in this? Zagat doesn't have the five-star review system. They have a 100-point scale. Yeah. And Zagat's like, no, we don't want to be in your system. And it made them a, uh, where Google pretty much had to buy them to include them. Right. right? Yeah, the, it was behind a paywall. No doubt because Google wanted to include them. Zagat. Like, no doubt Google wanted to include them. So it was a matter, I think, at some point, Google right. realized it was in their interest to buy them. Uh, speaking of in your interest to buy, yes. let's talk about Carbonite sure. for a minute. But before, it was a good segue? Well done. Uh, but before we do that, I'm going to give my honest honest, blunt evaluation for the first time of the TechCrunch My Garrington situation after this important message. Wow. Yes, I am. Uh, that's to keep you around. Cliffhanger. That's yeah. a right. cliffhanger. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, guys. You got a uh, hey, Carbonite is a great product. I use it. Tyler uses it. Tyler used it. I do now. He, he does now. <laughs> if we lost a little, Jeez. couple files. Oopsie, oopsie. Um, My hard drives have an average life of four years. That's from the Apple Genius Bar. Right. Come on. Right, for it's you. Good, it's yeah, going to crash. It's a ticking time clock. Yeah. It's a ticking time bomb. That's exactly right. And Carbonite will defuse that bomb securely and automatically backing up your files. The um, amazing, amazing small business version is just two twenty nine a year. They have commercials on TV. I'm watching TV. Yeah, it's because it's a great product. They have a full-on, Everybody... like, I'm watching yeah, 60 do. Minutes, and there's a Carbonite commercial. Of course yeah, there is, exactly. because backing up is important. And, hey, it's so important that I decided, or I should say Tyler decided, he's going to give away a MacBook Air. And so if you sign up for Carbonite Small Business using the promo code TWIST, T-W-I-S-T, Forward your receipt to Tyler at contests at thisweekend.com, and you'll be entered into the drawing. And I think uh, only like two or three dozen people have uh, signed up for that yet. Because people don't take the time to sign up for these contests, which means your chances are probably going to be like one in 50. So go ahead, and hey, you can always cancel if, uh, but why would you? But you can cancel if you, if you don't like it. That They're so confident in their product. Yeah. And as you know, any of the products that I talk about the show is one that we use. There's only two ad slots, so it basically we sell out so quickly for the ads that we can turn people away. I turned away some other backup companies because I didn't like the fact that they didn't have all you could eat unlimited. I said, mm -hmm. hey, I just I can't get behind your product anymore. And so I can't do that. Yeah, yeah Carbonite just lives on your desktop. It's really, it works. It's no, but really you're, exactly, you're a Carbonite user. Yeah. I, you're yeah. exactly right. They do two of the main things that killer confidence startups do, which is unlimited. Unlimited. And make it incredibly simple to stop anytime. Yeah, yeah. True. You know, Uninstall, no, boom, boom, refund, done. Boom. Pay as you go. All right, thank you to Carbonite. All right, let's talk about the Mike Arrington situation. I don't even know what the latest is. Go. Uh, I, I'm, I probably don't know what the latest is either because it changes yeah. every 10 minutes. Yeah. But uh, to sum up, to sum up where we are so far, uh, about a week ago, Mike Arrington and AOL announced he's stepping down as full-time editor of TechCrunch. He's starting a new VC firm, Crunch Fund. Yes. Includes a who's who of angel investors and VC firms. Uh, it's a $20 million fund. Then, over the next few days, 
all sorts of interviews from key AOL personnel, including Ariana Huffington and Michael Arrington, and they all seem to have different opinions about what his role is actually going to be, mm -hmm. ranging from he won't be involved at all to I am TechCrunch and TechCrunch is me. Uh, then concerns start to be raised in the press. Uh, David Carr from the New York Times, Kara Swisher, uh, Kara Swisher from All Things D, about the conflict of interest. Uh, and then a bunch of posts are coming out from TechCrunch. M.G. Siegler wrote one. Uh, Arrington himself wrote one. Um, Paul Carr uh, as well. Paul Carr is going to quit. Uh, they're, they're all, His they're one all... incomprehensible blog post <laughs> a week. <laughs> it's... it's uh... You know, it, There's a threat that's got Tim Armstrong on his knees. Right, uh, and, Paul and, Carr's and, unreadable post. And Arrington week. at the top of his puts a, a clip from 300 in it. There are yeah. the Spartans holding off. All uh, of this means, of course, that there is a conference next week that they need attention yes, for. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're right. TechCrunch Disrupt is, uh, is upon us. Uh, so anyway, uh, the latest is apparently the Arrington had said I would either accept Huffington Post not having anything to do with TechCrunch, and I'll just report to Tim Armstrong, yeah. or they sell me back TechCrunch. They're not selling them back TechCrunch. So now it's it's being worked out behind yeah. the scenes, but uh, Fortune and CNN had reported that he had, Arrington had been terminated. They've sort of walked that back, and we're not exactly sure what the status is right now. So that's the latest I have. Okay, so number one. I, re I first reported in July mm -hmm. on my Twitter account that Mike was going to do a fund, because somebody had told me Mike's raising a fund. So I tweeted, and I even tweeted the name, Crunch Fund. I don't get any credit for this, I, but I, I launched that on the 15th. Number, so that's number one. Number two, um, when Mike and I were partners, he frequently uh, would premeditate fights with people in order to get attention. This was classic Mike. Mike would, say to, Mike would say to me, hey, let's start a fight over this. You take this position, I take this position. So it's very premeditated mm -hmm. with Mike to do it, get attention through fights. I mean, I would tell him, please don't publish my emails. And then he would do it and say, write a blog post about me not fi publishing right, it. Because yeah. he just wanted more attention. He's, he's a master at getting this kind of attention. It works. It works. However, I think the real issue here is, um, for Tim Armstrong, this is making him look really bad. Because he's, I mean, as Kara Swisher pointed out, it's a public company. And this is shenanigans. And public companies have shenanigans. Uh, the board and the shareholders they get um, upset. Nervous. And they get nervous. Like, well, if Tim can't control this blogger, yeah. that's going to be the perception, then why would I own the stock? A and people are not going to buy AOL stock, or they're going to sell AOL stock, and AOL stock's going to tank because of stuff like this. And when Mike got in the fight with Engadget, it drove the Engadget founders out that Tim Armstrong didn't come to bat for them. I know this for a fact, because I hired those guys. And they told me this. Right. They felt like when Mike attacked them, that they didn't get backed up by Tim Armstrong, and Tim Armstrong lost the Engadget crew because of that Mike Arrington situation mm -hmm. in large part. That's a real ramification, to lose that many talented people in one of your number one properties because somebody is attacking them. I think it was the number one property, no? Well, maybe, I don't know. I don't know what all the properties are in there, but maybe it's quite possible that Engadget it's is. It's up there. It's certainly a magnitude yeah. bigger. So, for Tim Armstrong, this is a disaster. That's and it just seems so chaotic. It may, that's what I'm saying. It makes it look like amateur do. hour. And yeah. Tim can't come out and publicly address this stuff because then it looks even worse. Yeah. Oh, my God, the CEO is spending his time on this little blog that makes 6 or $7 million a year when AOL is making a billion and yeah. it's got all these other bigger problems to deal with. Um, now, you have to also, if you're somebody who has uh, got a startup company and you're thinking about taking money, you really have to do due diligence on the people who invest in your company. Now the due diligence list of Mike Arrington is the, the crunch pad litigation, the fight with me, the fight with Engadget, the fight with the person who bought your company for $25 million. I mean, it, there's some things you just don't do in business. Like, you don't fight with people who just bought your company. You, you try to remain professional and not say bad things about them, not go into an explosive fight. So now, with all this like, list of things, I, I'm starting to think if I was a startup company, would I want Mike's money, right? I mean, am I going to wind yeah. up in a lawsuit with one of my investors, Mike Arrington, since he's so litigious? And am I going to wind up in a fight with him in a public fight? I don't know. And I see, I think that's where I think that he's making a mistake strategically. And if we were still friends, I would tell him that. Which is, I used to be the voice of reason for Mike. He used to call me and say, what should I do about this? What should I do about that? And I'd say, Mike, slow down. You don't have to fight anymore. You've arrived. Mike, you're doing great. You're on the Time 100 list. Slow down. Be the elder statesman. And, and, and be a little less aggressive and, and just be a little more magnanimous. And he couldn't do it. Liz, what are your thoughts on this? 
I think that uh, Arrington actually doesn't come out looking that bad in this. I think he's been able to use his blog as a way to uh, make people who already love, fear, respect, whatever him, who just find him as an interesting character, yeah. to, to paint this picture of himself as a victim of you know AOL screwing him over after they bought him. I think a lot of people will believe that story. I think if he gets fired, he'll probably get all the money that he would have had to work for otherwise. I don't think he ends up actually that badly in this situation. Yeah. And what are your thoughts, Andrew? I know you have some thoughts. You know what, actually, you convinced me to see it a different way. I was thinking that uh, along the lines of uh, what Liz said, I thought he's coming out okay. I think he's got a point when he says that uh, journalists have um, other biases, but I think you convinced me. I mean, hmm. as it is, I'm kind of doubting the, the um, I, I don't see Huffington Post as a news organization. I don't see any organization that they're connected with as having legitimacy. They're trying to, uh, uh, come across as more, they're, they're trying to come across as a real uh, news organization, and this takes away from that. You've convinced me. Yeah, my I, mind on it. A poor Ariana Huffington as well is trying to run a serious organization, and this is really the problem. AOL is trying to say, we're going to be the next mm -hmm. New York Times. We replace the New York Times. Right. We're hiring New York Times writers. And then you have this other, like, little, you know, insignificant property in terms of revenue and the bottom line. But very significant in terms of influence. Obviously, it's gotten a ton of press, and Mike knows how to, you know, bang the cage. Yeah. And, and it just makes it so unnecessary for them to have this risk factor, which is why they're trying to get closure on it. Um, and I, I wonder if he's going to show up for the event next week too, or if he'll even be allowed to go, or if he want to go. I mean, you yeah. want to know something? Here's an exclusive. Liz, you can have this as an exclusive. Hmm. I emailed Ariana Huffington and Tim Armstrong last night. Oh, really? Yes, I did. And you know what I said to them? <laughs> I'll be the MC New CEO of the show. Tech crunch. <laughs> no, 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 I'll MC the Disrupt tech Conference. Tech no, I said, if you need somebody to host the event next week, mm -hmm. to MC it, I'll do it for you because we're friends and, you know, just gratis. I'll, I'll help you, you know, get through the event if, you, if yeah. everybody doesn't show up. Just as a nice thing. And then, yeah. Well, we'll, look for, <laughs> so, we'll look for that next week. Have you heard back, Jason? I did hear. So I did. I did hear back, but I can't say what they said. <laughs> okay, that would be fair. unfair. Fair uh, but anyway, whatever. I mean, who cares? I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, there's so much more important things going on, and and it really just shows, like tech meme is just, it, tech meme is like, I love tech meme. I check it five times a day, but it's just tech meme is so in the pocket of TechCrunch, and it's just like every day it's just TechCrunch, TechCrunch, TechCrunch at the top, and it's like all these poor startups are trying to do something innovative in the world, and it's just taken over by, is Mike fired or not, and da, da, yeah, da. And Actually, I think that, to me, is the, is the bigger problem. Like, everybody's talking like, oh, you know, is this a conflict of interest? And then they're arguing back, oh, but Michael say mean things about companies that he's friends with or that he yeah. has an interest in. And I have no doubt that that's true. I've seen those posts. No, Michael's, to to Michael's told me many times, when we were friends, we're not friends anymore, mm. he told me many times that he uses TechCrunch as a weapon. He told me strategically how he uses it as a weapon. He told me that he can, the, the worst thing he can do is not cover you. Right, that's And he will I, do that to people. Yes. Then he can just cover your mistakes and make your mistakes into a big deal and not cover things. These were his strategies. And he said to me, point blank, what's the point of having power if you don't use it? Right? That's what he said to me. And when I started the relationship with Mike, you know, Kara Swisher, your boss, said to me, what are you doing in business with Mike Arrington? He's got no class. You shouldn't be in business with him. You're a great guy, Jason. You're respected. He's going to drag you into this mud pit with him. And you know what? She was right. He did. Liz, what do I, you think? Okay, two points. Yeah. One, um, I think I, I, I know it's not too much money to them, but the VCs who invested in the French fund, yeah. what were they thinking? I think they, you know, I think Mike Arrington has this kind of like alternate universe that he believes in yeah. where it's okay to be to say one thing, do another thing, have conflicts, whatever. Yeah. But those VCs, I mean, I feel like in a way, I mean, I don't mean to exaggerate too much, but I feel like they're kind of like arms dealers to a, you know, a dictator or something like that, where it's like, really? Like, you don't have to see it that way. You don't have to pay for that access. I thought you, you know, had yeah. something going for yourself. Liz, I think you... And the other thing is that TechCrunch writers usually annoy me by writing, so putting themselves in the story too much. Yeah. But this week, they actually are the story, so right. it's been, you know, it's worked a little better. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a very interesting, Liz, uh, you say, like, why did these VCs do it? I talked to a bunch of them, actually, and I think for them, it's, a, it's just, like, interesting to put a million bucks. It doesn't hurt them. 
And what if they miss the next Facebook or they miss the next Groupon or the next Zynga or the next Twitter? That's the cost. And so their perception is Mike's very well connected. There's a chance that he might actually be the first person into one of those companies. They can't afford to not take that risk, and it, it means nothing. Now, it is bizarre that they would enable somebody who has been so brutal to them and so unfair to founders. I mean, you're talking about a guy who has just threatened founder after founder and tried to destroy people personally. But did they think he was more dangerous to have as an enemy? I mean, that's, that's, and that's what I'm saying. Exactly, like, the whole thing feels like... That's little, exactly... Like, well, that's what was. Liz's point is. It's like yeah. you're giving money to a terrorist or an arms deal- right. dealer. You know, it's like... Well, he's not fighting against me, so if I give him money, if I arm the terrorists, then maybe they won't blow up my city. And that's exactly what they've done. It makes no sense. I mean, he really has the ability to terrorize people because of the TechCrunch blog. And without it, it's going to be very interesting to see if he still has that ability to terrorize people the way he is. I mean, people are scared to death of what TechCrunch writes or doesn't write. Let me tell you something. Since I broke up with Mike, he said nothing but terrible things about me at TechCrunch. My life has gone on. You don't need TechCrunch to survive as a tech company. He can't stop you from being amazing, and he can't make you amazing. There's this massive misperception of his ability to anoint people. It's almost like a rite of passage. You want your startup to get into TechCrunch. Then you've arrived. Then you're, you know, it confirms legitimacy in some way, I think. Well, I'll make an offer right now. Uh, Ariana and Tim, I will uh, take over as CEO of TechCrunch. You can sell it to me, and uh, I'll be classy and awesome to you guys. So just sell it to me. It's an open offer. Ranker, we've got a lot of great products. I'd love Absolutely. To, uh, Let's go to the next story. About. This is so uh, boring. Twitter CEO Dick Costolo announced in a sort of State of the Union style address this week, yep. Twitter has 100 million active monthly users now and 400 million monthly visitors to its yep. website. Also, uh, an interesting t- statistic was revealed. 40% of active users don't create their own tweets. They just read submissions from other people. Uh, statistics indicate that Twitter is on track to add as many users in the next four months as they added in 06, 07, 08, and 09 combined, 26 million. Uh, the jump from January of 250 million monthly users may be partially attributed to an increase in mobile use. 55% of active users now access Twitter through mobile platforms and apps. Uh, so uh, the one thing that the Costola did not talk about, the growing issue of Twitter spam, other than to say they're doing a much better job with spam. So what did you think of the speech, if you heard the highlights, and what do you think uh, about where Twitter is headed? I think Twitter is doing awesome in terms of product release. Liz, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it was good for for Dick to invite everyone in and kind of talk about things. There wasn't really any news. There was this long-awaited statistic of how many people actually use Twitter, which um, I didn't really buy his excuses for why they didn't release that before. But, you know, now the numbers look good, so they're talking about them. I think it's... I was really interested to hear about how Twitter is not really a social network, how there's all these people who use it while not logged in. Right. Something that I think we all could have assumed, but now there's some more numbers about it. Yeah, and I think that that uh, what I think what they're trying to do, messaging wise, and Fred Wilson's really because he's tight with Dick, obviously put him in there, and the founders are out now. What they're really trying to do is tell the story that it's not a social network. This is a broadcast tool Mm -hmm. for the world and for individuals, and that is an important thing. But they're really trying to not get caught up in the trap which Yahoo got caught in. Yahoo was always trying to compare themselves to Google, when what they should have been doing is comparing themselves to the New York Times or News or some other company, so that when they looked at the growth, it wasn't like, oh, our growth compared to this rocket ship of a search engine and, and the earnings of a search engine is so crazy. Um, I think they want to get out of the Twitter versus Facebook discussion and just say, hey, we're a place where all these celebrities post their stuff and people consume it. We're the new medium for famous people and powerful people and your friends and your family just to get updates on them. And it's okay that you don't contribute. I think, yeah. it's, I think it's a smart messaging move is to try to move themselves away from the Facebook discussion, which they look tiny next to Facebook, just like everybody in the world looks tiny compared right. to Facebook. Yes, Andrew, what are your Facebook. thoughts? I think the spam problem is is huge on Twitter right now. I did a search earlier today to see if Howard Stern was on this week. I just searched for Howard Stern, and I came across, um, uh, what is this? It's like people are just keyword spamming. They type in the yeah. name Howard Stern, they type in iPod, Gateway, Computers, any other thing that you might search, and a link to some spammy ad, to some spammy web page. And I actually happen to have interviewed a few people on my side, on Mixergy, who, who do spam Twitter. And there's good money in it. And until those guys are shut down and they're they're kept from making money, Twitter is is gonna is gonna have a problem. I feel like um, I, I totally agree. Especially with, that. with those uh, um, the sponsored tweets, 
when you do a search for one of those sponsored hashtags and you see spam that has to do with uh, fake Gucci bags and uh, and porn, it turns people off. It's it's a it's a search is a disaster for spam. Yeah, and, and it's so easy for people to get traffic. And anytime just, you, you even know. mention one of those keywords, that's the other thing. It's not even just searching for keywords. If I say, hey, I was just playing with my friend's iPad, I get like 20 spammy at replies, like free iPads here and buy It's an unbelievable. IPad. Well, like, try to be a super router when you, when you have 100,000 people and yeah. you have a name like at Jason, very short. I mean, I get, I can't read my at replies anymore. It's, there's that much spam in it. It is a yeah. true issue. Um, but, you know, I have to say, since the founders left, um, you know, they, they, somebody told me something very insightful. Evan Williams never um, met a. You were with me when this person told me. I know. We're not going to say. We're not going to say who said it. Right, right. Um, but but an incredibly knowledgeable person. Yes, yeah, somebody with a lot. Of, <laughs> said Evan Williams never fed, never met a decision that he was willing to debate more and put off. No, no, no. The word his words were Evan never. There was never a decision he couldn't leave till tomorrow. Yes, yeah. and. De Costolo never met a decision he couldn't make yesterday. That's right. It pretty much sums it up. I mean, Costolo is addicted to getting stuff done. He is like one of those like performance-driven guys. Yeah. I mean, he just took feed burner from zero to hero in like overnight. And look what he's done with Twitter. Like in the last year, image hosting. Uh, That's big. At replies, like a news feed, so you can see people liking your stuff. The mm -hmm. server, nobody's talking about the server going down anymore. Yeah, I mean, you during don't, Evan Williams' well tenure much, yeah. and Jack's tenure, it was just like they couldn't keep up with the growth. So apparently, Fred Wilson made a pretty good bet putting Dick Costolo in. I mean, I'm friends with Evan, I hate to see the founder go. And I think ultimately bringing Jack in is going to help them. But the fact that they can release product finally again is awesome. And they have to, have to keep that up, add games, add video, whatever it is, they, they have to keep up with the Joneses and, and involve the product. Yeah, in the um, chat room they are talking about the, maybe the best use case of Twitter, which is as a real-time local news search sort of uh, system. They were talking about the San Diego blackout, it helps people keep in touch during that. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously, if anything happens in the world, it is the best place to go best, first. It, first it, it replaces CNN, that, it replaces that CNN in that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's the, as an early adopter, though, the big issue for me is that I only follow 85 people, and I only ever have. Right. Oh my. But still, of those people, people are getting too loose with, on the keyboard. Like, yeah, I'm getting the 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 level of insightful tweets as opposed yeah, but you, to you believe you should read everybody's everything. That's correct. Right. I, yeah. I, I, the rest of us don't look at it that way, Tyler. But We're not, none of us are competent. <laughs> We're just like, if I happen to see your tweet, I see it. Right. But now what's happened is everybody is, because these social media experts, right, Andrew, are saying like, oh, the time of day. So tweet something five times, you'll get five different groups of people. Yeah. So now the best practice, correct me if I'm wrong, Andrew, is tweet five times the same message so you get maximum click through, right? Actually, I saw the guys at Awesome. They showed me... Um, uh, Mark Suster's tweet traffic, and there's a reason why he retweets stuff a couple of times a day. Based on the time of day he tweets, he'll get more or less people. And if he tweets uh, a, the same link over and over, he'll get more clicks on it. That the, is definitely true. The data says we, do it more than once. We oh. see that. We see that too. If there, there's the, there's windows yeah. during the day where you'll get a lot more eyeballs than other parts of the, even during the middle of the afternoon. So, so the the problem is that you know what my the, most the initial is? innocence of the whole thing is. Kind of tarnished. It's, yeah, it and depends it's, on how you look at it. You look at it as a, if it's becoming a broadcast mechanism, yeah. it's less interesting on a community basis, so it's, it's going to run. Yeah. You know what my uh, most retweeted tweet and most favorite one was of the last like year? I said, breaking, 100% chance that Anderson Cooper is going to wear a totally cute windbreaker. <laughs> well, that's, that's it was perfect, during the hurricane. Uh, I did like a hurricane. Yeah, perfectly <laughs> set up for the Twitter's yeah. demo. You're I actually demo. know how to totally manipulate your cloud score. Just put in a quote by Winston Churchill every three days. And you just put in any Winston Churchill quote. Mm -hmm. yeah. You get 50 retweets. You just gave him to the cloud. Or respond to something Snoop. Next story, next story, next story, next story. That's uh -huh. the cloud is the new thing in the game now. It's uh -huh. no longer necessarily uh -huh. about Let's your move on. Uh, Hulu's Let's been... do lightning round. Next, oh, okay. Next one goes to Liz. Uh, we're talking about Google and Hulu. Hulu's been looking to sell. Word is Amazon, Yahoo, Dish Network have all already made offers, apparently in the 1.5 to 2 billion range. Uh, but now it seems Hulu, Google may be entering the fray, made a considerably larger offer than the other companies, uh, but they're not bidding on what Hulu's selling. They, uh, uh, they want something else, maybe greater access to the libraries, extended period mm -hmm. of time. Who knows? Uh, so that's, that's, that's the question. Okay, Liz, uh, who's going to buy it? Who should buy it? I, 
Yeah, well, I'm pretty interested in this, in Google buying it, because, um, you know, I think YouTube and Hulu have been kind of obsessed with competing with each other for a long time, but I don't think they actually ever successfully have. Right. I mean, YouTube has never gotten the premium content that they hoped they would get. And, but I don't know, I mean, I'm not sure how good an asset is given that for, for YouTube, because Hulu is all domestic, right? I think all of their licenses are just for the U.S. So they just that be, opened in Japan. That would be kind of out of sync with the rest of, true. of, of uh, YouTube. But I could see them setting it up like some kind of site. Like, you know how they have Vivo now for music videos? So Hulu would be like a sub-site of YouTube. I think it could be interesting. It definitely is in line with the whole, you know, Larry Page, Big Bet thing. Uh, Google will successfully buy it. Yahoo should have bought it. Yeah, Yahoo's just mismanaged, but we know that. <laughs> um, Google will buy it. Google already has all of these eyeballs that they can't monetize because premium advertisers don't want to be on cats falling off televisions or kids biting people's fingers, <laughs> whatever it is. Right. So now you take all that traffic. Are you making fun of Charlie? I mean, I, I, did, he, Charlie? did he just maybe slam the, Charlie? Maybe the most popular Hold on. video of all time. The point is it's a cute video, but not everybody wants to put their ads in front of it. Right. However, you put Charlie bit my <laughs> finger. David Dennis, though. You put yeah. Charlie bit my finger next to two and a half men. <laughs> They're Charlie all Sheen. on roughly the same I level. Both have a Charlie in the keyword. Right. But you put that over there, and then people click that. Now you get some premium advertising. And the advertising on Hulu has been sold out at prices higher, higher than television. With good reason it's higher than television. You can click and you can consummate the uh, transaction, and which you cannot no, do. And there's no DVR. And there's no, there's no uh, yeah, direct And you TV. can't fast skip, forward. I can't skip my Hulu commercials. Yeah. Absolutely. But see, what Google is afraid of is that they'll look stupid buying Hulu for $3 billion, And then in two years, they have to go back to the table and give another $3 billion and another $3 billion from those studios. So they want to do is, they're trying to say to the studios, don't make us look stupid. Give us five years so we don't look stupid. We'll, get, we'll back up $6 billion, whatever, $4 billion, whatever you want. Let's give us a longer runway so we don't look mm -hmm. stupid well, after we buy this. Um, but yeah. why would they sell it? I mean, if it's doing so well, I don't understand why uh, CBS never participated, but why would Fox and all these guys sell it? I guess they just want to make the quick hit on cash, make the buyer look stupid by making them re-up for another $3 billion for the libraries. Yeah. They just want to make as much as they can off of the... Show next story, next story, next story. Uh, so Facebook, uh, according to a memo to potential investors, Facebook's revenue doubled to $1.6 in 2011's first half, with the net income for the same period nearly $500 million. That's double what it made for that period in 2012 and 2010. Wow. The news led investors to push its valuation to roughly $80 billion in private markets. Social networks' user count is now over $750 million. It's not clear exactly how much, uh, how the revenues divided up, uh, how much of it's advertising versus Facebook's cut of sort of sales of virtual goods and other things people are using Facebook credits on. So Facebook, obviously profitable, uh, obviously going to face other obstacles as it heads towards an expected 2012 IPO. What are they, and can Facebook sustain this level of growth? Andrew. I'm excited to see that we're talking about money in tech. I think too many times we say money isn't important, it's a technology, it's the social that's fun, but I, I was actually just reading uh, In the Plex, where uh, the book about Google, where Sergey Brin said that the defining moment for Google was earning money, that before then he felt like a schmuck. He had a startup, everyone else had a startup, but his startup wasn't profitable. As soon as it was profitable, it felt like a real business and it enabled him to invest in creative ideas like driverless cars, like Google Docs, like Android that became a whole product onto itself. I think now that they've got money, um, they're gonna be able to do some really creative things. Well, going to be able to, buying Motorola, buying Hulu, uh, buying Zagat, I mean, they're off, right. they can't spend money fast enough. I, I, he means like Facebook. Yeah, yeah. That, <clears throat> I think Facebook now no, is I know, but I mean, Facebook then now, why isn't creativity. Facebook going on an acquisition spree? Why did, why they do, but they they get these tiny, they tiny little, they buy, yeah, yeah, they just buy yeah. people and, and yeah. they're just, I think that they're just blocking those people from creating the next Facebook, That's which is a smart move. Like, mm. hey, let's give these engineers a million Although dollars each. You have to love his move investing in diaspora. Yeah, well, that was just <laughs> that like the kiss awesome, of death. Awesome. Um, but a billion dollars in profits a year, $80 billion market cap, 80 times price earnings ratio, high. I told my friends who own significant shares Maybe in Facebook math. to sell half. Mm -hmm. I said sell half of your shares at 80 billion, 100 billion, and then free roll the rest. But don't risk not selling half your shares. And they did they get out of their deal space that they were gonna the whole yeah, kind of group? Yeah, they, folded. They, clo they closed down place. Everybody folded. Yeah, but I mean this is the thing. If you were Yahoo, going offers. back to Yahoo for a second, mm -hmm. how stupid is Yahoo? They for got a not ton doing of deals. local people. Yes. The second they see Groupon, knock that 
off. Just knock it <laughs> off. And can you imagine if you logged into Yahoo and you were in San Diego or in New York City and it just said, boom, you know, a thousand things. How many people would buy it if it was on the Yahoo homepage? They, they could build the, they already have the hundred million dollar, the hundred million email database that Groupon wishes they had. Yeah. And AOL, they also folded like the, you know. So now that's the new they rumor. They folded WoW. Is Yahoo, a is Yahoo AOL going to merge? Ugh. That's just a total disaster. <laughs> I mean, we don't have any other. Uh, if you can't keep the one e if, like if, if you can't like Chrysler and no. Gannett in there, so if you can't keep it's one. It's like the Titanic hitting the Hindenburg. Yeah. yeah. And the Dodgers are going to buy it. Wait a second. It's like the Titanic hitting the Hindenburg. I just think that you guys missed an insight. It's like the Hindenburg <laughs> hitting, <laughs> hitting the, the Titanic. Titanic. It really is. It's like, oh, the humanity. <laughs> it's like everybody's going to die. Disaster yeah. on disaster. <laughs> disaster on disaster. Last story. Uh, ooh, last story. Okay. Uh, Austin, Boston, D.C., Denver, and Seattle residents can now all try out Google Offers. The company expanded the beta of its daily deal service. Uh, offers initially debuted in April in Portland, San Francisco, and New York. Uh, Google, as you'll recall, attempted to buy Groupon in late 2010. Deals giant memorably declined the reported $6 billion offer. Uh, so now uh, Google's created its own offers product. Initial offerings in the new cities range from discount Mexican food in Austin to cheap books in Denver to half price tickets for the Seattle Aquarium. So uh, with Groupon's pulled IPO and shaky financial numbers, could Google offers pull out ahead? Google Offers is good. I mean, I've, I've looked at the New York, they don't have it in Los Angeles yet, but I was looking right. at the New York ones. It was high quality stuff, and they were getting hundreds of people, low thousands of people to use it. I think Google's gonna have a viable product. What are your thoughts, Liz? I think this shows actually a pretty big difference between Google and Facebook. I mean, Facebook just shut down their deals product, or they're going to, they announced they're going to. Um, but kind of kind of a strange announcement, right? They just like uh, did an offhand comment to Bloomberg or something. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, I mean, I think Facebook is not comfortable when they are out of their core product, and Google is, and that's a huge difference. I mean, Google is totally fine to copy Groupon, do Groupon better, um, pursue that business, hire all the local salespeople. Facebook got into something where it was like, ooh, we're really not innovating here, we're not adding anything. I mean, I don't know exactly the reasons they shut it down, but they ran away from it, right? Yeah. I don't think it was going that badly. I think they just were like, ah, this is, this is bad, we can't, get, we can't do this, this isn't our core business. Yeah, it's just weird that they didn't stick with it for a long time. But perhaps they thought, Liz, that we don't want to build this whole local sales force against Yelp, against Groupon, against Living Social, against Google. What's the point of being, you know, number three, four, or five in a space when we're number one and we're just throwing off cash? Probably Sheryl Sandberg is reining in young Zuck on some of these projects. I'm assuming that Zuck pushed on this one uh, and did it. The one thing that Facebook has not done, which I think is it might be the opposite, but or maybe the I opposite. Think, I think oh, it yeah. might be the opposite. I think that like if you look at Facebook as a product and the way that they do their yeah. their their launches, they really try to say we're adding something to this by making it social. This is right. different from what came before, and you can you can't say that with deals. They tried. Right. They said like we're only going to sell things that you can do with your friends, so right. no you know haircuts. But that's that's not a difference. They're, you know, it's not it's not. Yeah, it was a, You're right. They do have this party line of if we're going to do something, we have to add a social spin to it which to me doesn't make any sense. Like, you don't have to do that. I mean, I, I was talking to a couple of the Facebook execs and I was like, well, why don't you have a YouTube competitor? You know, because they were talking to me about video. Hey, video is gonna be a lot more important to us. You guys are doing video, let's discuss. So we're discussing stuff. And I was like, well, why don't you have a full-blown video competitor to YouTube? And they were like, well, we would, Mark would need, they literally said, Mark would need to come up with something. like." Oh, Mark has to come up with the idea where it's social. And I'm like, well, watching video clips is not inherently social. You could watch Charlie bit my finger and then just move on with your life. It doesn't have to be social, but look at all the video sharing, look at all the photo sharing you have. Why not replicate that in video? Yeah, well, maybe if we can get some social element. It's kind of forced, you know. Not everything is a social behavior. Well, there was chill just now. That's turntable for video. That's doing yeah, social, I'm, I'm, social video. I'm yeah. not saying you can't do something, but I'm not. What I'm saying is, do, you don't have to. It doesn't to right. be successful. It doesn't have to be. If I'm playing solitaire and it's the most played game on people's computers, it's called solitaire for a reason. It's a solitary thing. The deal thing still could, could have been a bit cooler and social because if you buy some deal. Right now, I don't know what the deals that you're buying, and it kind of would be interesting. Yeah. It, they, I, I don't know why they give up so quick. It's sort of. I wonder if they're going to start just giving up on like 
check-ins. It's all, but they do have so many opportunities at something like that. They might have something yeah. cooler, bigger that they're focused on. Hey, next up is this week in social media. And so we're going to uh, hand it over in a couple of minutes. So make sure you stick around. We're going to try today for the first time. Just like letting you watch the studio, this like studio camera they have up oh, on the ceiling here. I'll nice. show that for a second. So yeah, we have those, like, so you're gonna watch them set up the studio and do all this interesting stuff. Hey Liz, what else are you working on? What, what, what can we expect out of all things D this weekend and next week? And when's the Asia one coming up? I'm actually coming back for your next show to talk about Twitter. Oh, awesome, <laughs> more Twitter. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yeah, this weekend I'm hoping to get to some cool projects about you know new trends in social startups, which actually I think are the most interesting since I've ever started covering them right now. I mean, I think like a year ago, it kind of looked like social equals Facebook, and now it doesn't, and that's fun. Yeah, what were your favorite social companies? I, I'm, I'm getting a little enamored with the old Instagram now. Oh well, yeah, I really like using Instagram. There's a bunch of really cool ones coming too. I think there's some neat stuff around um, understanding your friends better um, and having like more intimate relationships, not that way, but in more <laughs> close relationships. And uh, understanding the past, I think the social networks right now are like way too focused on what happened a minute ago, but there's right. so much um, wealth of history and interactions there you can show in interesting ways. There's, there's cool stuff coming up. Yeah, I think some of the tools are gonna be interesting. Now, are you gonna go to the Disrupt concert? Concert yeah, conference? Yeah, or are you gonna go to right demo? To, or demo? I'm, go I'm going to Disrupt. My colleague Drake is going to demo. And they're, they're, having... they're like an hour apart, so we have to choose. And they're occurring on the same day, just like we had the problem with TechCrunch 50 three years ago. No, the original TechCrunch 40 was on the, the same day. The original 40, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's and kind of bizarre. There's like, you know, 100 startups launching on Monday. It seems like a ridiculous way to launch when everyone, all everyone wants to pay attention to is do their engine show up. Yeah, exactly. Well, and this is what I told him, actually. It was one of the big fights Mike and I had when we were doing TechCrunch 50 together was, I said, we're not the story, the startups are the stories. And he wanted to have panels, and he wanted to have keynote speakers. And I said, no, you put Carol Bartz in the room, you put Tim Armstrong in the room, you put Larry Page in the room, whatever it is. It sucks the attention because then the writers like Liz have to write about what they said. They're obligated. And right. Liz well, can only huge. file, what, three times at a show like that? Two or three times you have the time to file? That means one or two of the three slots that she has to file, or whatever other journalist is there, is going to yeah. be taken by Carol Bartz saying the F word. Because they have that, they have this obligation to cover it. It's a big deal. And um, Yeah, I mean, I feel like that we're just turning these startup presentations into these total, like, cattle auctions, you know? I just went to the latest Y Combinator. There's 63 startups. It's like, too many. the only thing I'm going to get out of that event is that there were a lot of companies, not that individual ones were interested in. Yeah, I mean, so I'm trying, but, um, but I, it's too many. It's too many, and it's also a, a real, it's a, it's a trend in the industry that too many people are working on too small projects. What's gonna have to happen over the next five years is this indigestion is gonna have to get resolved one way or the other. And indigestion tends to get resolved one way or the other. And we're gonna have to take these startups and consolidate them down. I think the trend is gonna be merging three or four Y Combinator companies in a vertical to make something that's a more comprehensive product. Yeah, well. it's already happening for sure. Yeah, people are running out of money, and they're getting to the end of these convertible notes, and it's got to convert. There's a reason it's called a convertible note, folks. You know, because it converts into equity, and you have to, or it converts, and you have to pay it back, or it converts into equity. A lot of these angel investors could just say, you know what, we want our money back at the end, and then what do the startups do? Hey, uh, what are you working on, Andrew? So I've interviewed hundreds of entrepreneurs on Mixergy, including many of the ones that you've talked about, like the founders of Groupon, founders of Living Social, and yep. others. Now I'm inviting many of them back and asking them to mm. teach what they're good at. So for example, just yesterday I recorded a course with uh, the founder of MixRank. I said, show us your computer screen, teach us step by step how you find the websites where you buy traffic, give me a copy of the email you send as an opening shot to negotiate with a publisher to buy an ad and show me how you convert it into profits. And so they walk us through their process on their screens as we talk and explain it. He's such a smart guy. Yeah. So smart. Yeah, yeah. He's always got something. <laughs> working on when stuff. I grow up, I want to be Andrew Warner. <laughs> hey, Lon, how's everything at Ranker? Good? Good, yeah. Traffic okay. way up. Uh, so, uh, you know, things are things are working pretty well. You can go check it out right now. We're, we're doing a better job now keeping up with the, the mm. news. That was a big thing I wanted to start doing. Hey, if you guys want to join I'm the back channel, go to twistlist.co and join the email list. There's 150 people or so on that list, and it, 138 to be exact. And you can join for as little as $2 a month. Tyler, uh, and how's everything going in your world? Okay? Yeah. Cool. All right. There you go. All right, everybody, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Andrew. We'll see you next time on This Week in Startups. Stay Thank tuned you. for This Week in Social Media, which is going to be starting in just minutes. Stay tuned. We're going to leave the microphones up. See you next time, guys.
studio. Hey guys, picture in a picture of the studio, please. Put, the, put our credits in one window, put the studio picture in another. Quickly, losing audience. Just switch to the studio camera then. Oh, cow. Sorry to get this thing stuck. Guys, switch to the studio camera. There you go. Okay. Good. So now you can see in the room. Microphone is still up, right? Okay, yeah. okay good. So this mic is staying right here. And you've got him coming in? He's coming in momentarily. So oh, awesome. right. you guys. Well, I'm good. Clear out there. So make sure everybody knows that we are, in fact, uh, still. Uh, Wave the lights from the And uh, how was the show, everybody, in the chat room? Did you have a good time? I hope so. Log out. Logging out. Logging yeah, 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 yeah. Alright guys, if I can get you to swap out, I gotta get my other guests in here, hosts and everything. Tyler, do you want to actually? Uh, no. Uh, that the twin sword jar is fine. Keep the sword jar.